I want to talk to you today about a man whom we think we know well, so well indeed that we think we have, let, uh, we have little left to learn about him. I'm talking about, as you already know, George W. Bush. There are very few people in the United States on any part of the political spectrum who haven't formed strong views about the man. Certainly, I would expect that to be true of most of you sitting in the room today. And yet, there are many things we don't know about him. And once we grasp what they are, it will necessarily cause us to acknowledge that there is more complexity to this man than we often grant, and that explanations for the failed nature of his presidency, and I do think it has been a failure, require more work and thought than we may be inclined to give it. It is in that spirit that I offer these remarks today. The Bush we don't know is the Bush who is a multiculturalist, a man more comfortable with diversity and more inclined to see it as central to the present and future of America than any Republican president who occupied the Oval Office before him. For most of his career, Bush has been worlds apart from Patrick Buchanan and the social conservative wing of the Republican Party, who wanted to restore America to its imagined Anglo-Saxon and Anglo-Celtic glory. Bush has wanted relatively open borders with Mexico and a road to citizenship for illegal aliens. Bush has been willing to incorporate diversity, bilingualism, and cultural pluralism into his vision of what America should be. Who, 30 years ago, could have predicted that the first president to appoint a black man and a black woman to the position of Secretary of State and to make a Hispanic Attorney General would have been a conservative Republican from the state of Texas? Who, 10 years ago, would have anticipated that a conservative Republican would do a better job than two of the most famous liberal presidents of the 20th century, Woodrow Wilson and Franklin Roosevelt, at keeping interethnic and interracial relations relatively calm amidst the emotions and fears unleashed by war. Bush, during his presidency, has also continued to burnish the US military's reputation as the most successfully integrated institution in America. Generals with names such as Shinzeki, Abizade, Sanchez, and Odierno, men of Japanese, Arab, Hispanic, and Italian descent, rose to prominence during the years when Bush was commander in chief. In regard to the two controversial issues for which Bush stood to suffer at the hands of minority voters, his antagonism to the welfare state and to affirmative action, he and his advisors launched new policies to convince African Americans and Hispanics that Republicans were concerned about underlying issues of poverty, education, and jobs. The Republicans would deliver welfare through private rather than public institutions, churches in particular, and improve minority education and then success in the workforce through No Child Left Behind. Because of its scale and boldness, No Child Left Behind is likely the most significant social policy initiative of the Bush years. Rather than promote racial equality through affirmative action, which conservatives have long decried as the promotion of the unqualified, No Child Left Behind holds schools responsible for ensuring that all students and faculty reach satisfactory levels of competence. It is arguably the most ambitious public school initiative ever sponsored by the federal government, and it is currently convulsing education at all levels. Whatever one thinks about the particulars of this Bush program, it has had a coherence that liberal critics of the administration have too often overlooked. It promised immigrants tolerance and opportunity and African Americans achievement. It sought to appeal to the religiosity and social conservatism that run deep in Hispanic and African American communities. Its preference for delivering welfare through churches rather than government agencies was calculated in part to resonate among minority communities in which religious institutions have played an important role. In the time I have with you today, I want to probe the roots of this surprisingly robust Bush multicultural program and analyze how it unfolded across his presidency. I begin with some family history, specifically the multicultural implications of the Bush family's relocation from New England to Texas in the 1940s. The Bush's family moved to Midland, Texas in 1948, was part of a group effort by Northeastern families to stake their Ivy-educated sons, in this case, Yale-educated George H.W. Bush, son of Connecticut Sen Senator Prescott Bush, to promising careers in the booming Permian oil fields of West Texas. The scions of these families imagined that their sons would colonize a large portion of the Texas oil industry for family corporate interests in the Northeast. What they understood less clearly is how the migration of their sons to the Lone Star State would, over two generations, do less to expand the power of old New England elites 
than to create a new Southern elite with distinct economic, political, and cultural interests. One of those distinct developments was the engagement by these Northeasterners with the Mexican presence in Texas. Exposure to Mexicans in the oil business, in school, and at home is a consistent theme of George W. Bush's young life. He was two when his family moved to Texas. His father partnered with a Mexican entrepreneur in his oil exploration business. George W. saw Mexican laborers working in his father's oil fields. And at the public schools that George W. attended at Midland, approximately 25% of the student population was Mexican. A Mexican woman entered the Bush household in 1959 when Pear Bush moved the family to Houston. Hired to be the Bush's live-in live housekeeper, Paula Rendon stayed with the family for more than 30 years. She served as the emotional anchor for the Bush boys during their adolescence, especially as Barbara Bush became more remote, battling the depression that accompanied her growing isolation as politics increasingly preoccupied her husband. George W. Bush considers Rendon his second mother. Jeb Bush recalls that he adored her and learned Spanish from her. Jeb's comfort with Spanish language and Mexican culture may have played a role in his decision at age 17 to spend part of the year in Leon, Mexico, helping to build a school for the poor. There he was smitten with a local convent girl who knew no English. Columba Garnica Gala would become the love of Jeb's life and his wife, bringing Mexicanness and grandchildren of mixed Anglo-Mexican descent directly into the Bush family. These grandchildren were the little brown ones, as George H.W. Bush affectionately or condescendingly, depending on your perspective, liked to refer to them. George W. Re returned to Midland in 1975 after a 10-year sojourn through New England's elite educational institutions to make his father's path to business and then political success his own. Like his father, George W. Spent, went as part of a group of Ivy Leaguers from wealthy backgrounds whose families sensed that their sons could also make for, uh, fortunes from another Permian Basin oil rush, this one made possible by the quadrupling of oil pro, uh, prices in the wake of the Yom Kippur War and the formation of OPEC in 1973 and 1974. Most of these young men quickly made fabulous amounts of money and indulged in a nouveau riche and exclusively Anglo lifestyle of mansions, private schools, private clubs, and private planes for their business and pleasure. George W., however, didn't follow this script, in part because he showed little aptitude for making money. The social circuit of Bush and his pals revolved instead around family backyard barbecues and visiting local Mexican-American restaurants. Dona Anita's Mexican restaurants was one of their favorite hangouts. Bush befriend, re, befriended the Reyes family that owned the restaurant, as did other Mexican-Americans, as he did other Mexican-Americans, also involved in thriving family restaurant businesses. Bush identified with them as aspiring businessmen and relished the bicultural, biculturalism of these encounters, a biculturalism strengthened by the Texas culture that all these men shared. Bush became a pretty good Spanish speaker during this time. Bush's young wife, Laura, influenced his openness to Mexican-American culture too, as immediately prior to her marriage to George W., she had been teaching poor Latino kids in Austin's public schools. Bush's long-standing engagement with Mexicans prompted Israel Hernandez, an assistant secretary for commerce in the Bush administration, to remark that, quote, in every dimension of his career, whether it was politics or the private sector or the sports world, he's been engaged with the Hispanic population. The way in which Bush took religion into his life in the 1980s further contributed to the formation of his multicultural consciousness. Bush's embrace of Christ as his savior was born of personal crisis, failure in business, his parents' acute disappointment in him, alcoholism, and Laura's threat to leave him. Faith in Christ gave Bush a purpose, a discipline, and an ability to inject strong moral values into his life, characteristics he felt he lacked. Being born again made possible his recovery from addiction, the salvaging of his marriage, and the launch of a successful political career. And in an unusual, unusual twist, it also imbued him with a deep respect for other religions and other ways of finding faith. Nominally, Bush's embrace of evangelicalism led him to Methodism. But Bush was never much interested in denominational boundaries, nor does he ever seem to have believed that there was one 
or even an exclusively Protestant or Christian path to God. His introduction to Christ occurred not in church, but in personal meetings with evangelical ministers such as Billy Graham and in informal Bible study groups that met outside formal church structures. What he took from such meetings and study was not a message about the superiority of the Christian God and the evangelizing zeal that this God demanded of all his faithful, but rather the command to have faith and to lead a moral life. Bush came to believe that everyone who prays, prays to the same God, and that there is truth in all religions. As president, Bush would come to feel a keen partnership with the Muslim prime minister of Turkey, Recep Tayyip Erdogan, because the two men shared, in Bush's words, a strong belief in the Almighty. And the large Russian Orthodox cross that Bush saw Vladimir Putin proudly hanging from his neck inclined Bush to think that he and Putin would work well together. Bush's attraction to the new Europe of the East rested in part on his conviction that the Poles, Russians, and others who lived there were far more inclined than the old Europeans who lived in Western Europe to embrace a godly life. In foreign policy, these attitudes led Bush in remarkably naive directions, as in his Blythe declarations that he and Putin were soulmates and that all religious groups of the world were eager, if given the chance, to interweave their faith with Western notions of freedom. But in domestic affairs, Bush's ecumenism had different ramifications, most of them stemming from his comfort in reaching out to religious groups in the United States that were not white and or were not Protestant. Through such outreach to religious Catholic Jews and even Muslims, he laid the foundation for what we might call a multiculturalism of the godly. Bush's ability to develop an alliance with Hispanic Catholics would be the earliest and most important consequence of Bush's godly multiculturalism. The opportunity to, to pursue this sort of multiculturalism presented itself to Bush from the moment he entered Texas politics in the 1990s to run for governor. I have to take you back for a moment to the culture wars of the 1980s and 90s. They were then an obsession of American politics. These were battles fought between left and right over the place in American life of the hard multiculturalism that had emerged in the 1970s and 1980s. Hard multiculturalists argued that America had been so compromised by racism and sexism that the nation would never redeem its promise to minorities or to women. Members of subordinate groups had no alternative but to craft identities for themselves that were grounded not in American patriotism, but in racial, gender, or sexual communities, or in a cosmopolitanism that partook of no national identity whatsoever. Conservatives reacted angrily to this rejection of America's promise and sought to extirpate hard multiculturalism wherever it, advan it had advanced in public and, in some cases, private institutions. Conservatives believed that the multiculturalist principles had also led government social policy astray, especially in regard to the welfare state. Welfare, in their eyes, had become a way of coddling what they called welfare queens, tolerating a debilitating drug culture and its associated violence, and encouraging widespread promiscuity and moral laxity. A harsh, very harsh vision of the inner city poor emerged from these conservative fusillades. America's ghettos were depicted by conservatives as homes to a vast underclass that lay beyond the reach of civilization. These attitudes encouraged conservatives to rehabilitate old racist stereotypes, such as the use of the Willie Horton image in the 1988 presidential campaign to associate black men with criminality and rape. These attitudes gave Los Angeles cops license to beat savagely a black motorist, Rodney King, arrested for speeding, actions that in turn triggered the LA riots of 1992. Those were terrible riots, and they revealed not only the tenseness of black-white relations in America, but of immigrant-native-born relations as well. These developments brought to the fore Republican politicians determined to vanquish the hard multiculturalism that they blamed for these problems with a law and order morally absolutist and nativist conservatism. Leading the way was Republican firebrand and nativist Patrick Buchanan. At his side, was Pete Wilson, former San Diego uh, mayor and U.S. senator, who in 1991 became governor of California. 
In running for re-election re in 1994, Wilson became one of the most enthusiastic supporters of the anti-immigrant Proposition 187, a draconian initiative meant to strip California's illegal immigrants of their access to all public services, including social services, health care, and public schooling for their children. Wilson and Proposition 187 won by large margins in California, making it seem as though Fortress America politics were carrying the day. Indeed, Wilson began laying plans to ride this anti-immigrant law and order wave into the White House. By 1995, hard to remember now that he's a footnote in history, but by 1995, he was an odds-on favorite to capture the 1996 Republican nomination. From the moment that George W. Bush decided to run for the Texas governorship in 1994, he cast himself as the anti-Wilson. If Wilson was going to build a national reputation by positioning himself as the enemy of Latino immigrants, Bush was going to construct his by posing as their friend. If Wilson was going to become the unforgiving law and order Republican determined either to purge America of every last one of its criminals or else seal off every remaining crime-ridden ghetto and barrio with police force, Bush was going to become the compassionate conservative, finding a way to bring the poor, even those who were sinners, into American life under the aegis of conservative values. Bush had instrumentalist reasons for positioning himself as Wilson's opposite. He may have sensed that the support for Buchanan's and Wilson's nativism was in actuality softer than it appeared to be at the time. With Karl Rove already at his side, Bush understood in precise district by district, precinct by precinct terms, how indispensable the Texas Hispanic vote had become to his and Rove's largest ambition, building a permanent Republican majority in Texas and then in the nation. And he wanted to bring those voters into the Republican tent. In political economic terms, Bush intended to seize on California's deepening anti-Latino hostility to enlarge Texas's importance as the crossroads for hemispheric trade and to make Texas, rather than California, the entrepot for a hugely ambitious free trade zone covering all the Americas. Nevertheless, Bush's willingness to, to give these instrumentalist concerns such prominence in his thinking and in his politics revealed how deeply he believed that a properly constructed, religiously inflected multiculturalism was perfectly compatible with the conservatives' moral and economic values that he cherished. In this respect, it may be appropriate to see Bush and this characterization may surprise you, as the might surprise him too, as the Republican Bill Clinton. <laughs> what am I talking about? I don't know. Um, Bush was the GOP candidate who intended to lance the boil of the culture wars by putting forward a soft multiculturalism that merged diversity and patriotism. In the process of doing so, he, Clinton, and others would relieve the American body politics body politic of the distress and distraction that the culture wars had caused. Of course, the road to soft multiculturalism was different for each man. Clinton had to attack and discredit his hard multicultural left, as he did when he condemned the black hip-hop artist Sister Soldier in 1992 for her separatist anti-white diatribes. And at the same time, he embraced African Americans as few Democratic presidents before him had done. Bush had to, had to attack the Fortress America faction on his right, the likes of Buchanan, Wilson, and Ross Perot and his allies, and he did. And he matched Clinton's embrace of blacks with his own embrace of Hispanics. Bush's multicultural politics as governor first became apparent in the closed economic and cultural relations he sought with Mexico. He repeatedly expressed his support for open borders and endorsed NAFTA from the start. He condemned remarks by Buchanan in which Buchanan had declared that the next president ought to dump NAFTA, build a, wall, uh, build a wall along the border, and turn its back on Mexico. In contrast to Governor Pete Wilson, who refused to meet with the new Mexican president, Ernesto Zedillo, Bush attended Zedillo's inauguration and visited him three times during his first year in office. Butch, Butch, Bush matched his insistence on close relations with Mexico with the desire to make Mexican immigrants 
feel at home in Texas. He declared that a law like California's Proposition 187, meant to keep the children of illegal immigrants out of public schools, would never be passed in Texas. Once children are in Texas, Bush declared in 1995, Texans know it is in our best interest and their interest to educate them, regardless of the nationality of their parents. An educated child is a child less likely to commit a crime. An educated child is much more likely to become a responsible member of society, Bush's words. Bush even supported bilingualism. In a letter to Texas Republicans defending his decision as governor to support a bilingual program called English Plus in Texan schools, Bush emphasized, quote, the important richness that other language and cultures bring to our nation of immigrants. Here in Texas, the Spanish language enhances and helps define our state's history and tradition. Bush also positioned himself as, as a progressive Republican on the vexed issue of affirmative action. When the Fifth Circuit Court of Appeals ruled in 1998 that state universities could not consider the race of applicants in their admission decisions, Bush did not use the opportunity to take a stand against affirmative action. Instead, he proposed a new plan that he called affirmative access, by which he meant that affirmative steps needed to be taken to ensure that, quote, every person will get a fair shot based on his or her potential or merit. The phrase affirmative access was meant to free the discussion of affirmative action from the stigma of quotas. In practice, Bush actually supported a quota plan, but not one explicitly grounded in race. This was a plan to admit into the University of Texas all Texas high school graduates who ranked in the top 10% of their class. In order to fulfill this 10% obligation, Texas has had to radically expand the University of Texas system to accommodate all those eligible for admission. Texas currently possesses, as a result, the most rapidly growing and one of the most accessible and diverse systems of higher education in the country. As the liberal New York Times columnist Anthony Lewis has conceded, this plan has, quote, has had considerable success in maintaining student diversity in Texas. Bush himself was a supporter of diversity and believed that cultural variety strengthened America. Listen to the effusiveness of this selection from a speech he gave to a group of Hispanics in Miami in August 2000, and listen carefully. America has one national creed, but many accents. We're now one of the largest Spanish-speaking nations in the world. We're a major source of Latin music, journalism, and culture. Just go to Miami, or San Antonio, Los Angeles, Chicago, and close your eyes and listen. You could just as easily be in Santa Domingo, or Santiago, or San Miguel de Allende. For years, our nation has debated this change. Some have praised it, and others have, well, have resented it. By nominating me, my party has made a choice to welcome the new America. This was Bush in 2000. What a difference eight years can make. It is difficult to envision a presidential nominee of, uh, of either major party in 2008 talking in such open and glowing terms about the multicultural possibilities of the new America. Bush believed that this embrace of diversity, especially in connection to Hispanics, would strengthen his conservative political agenda. In addition to Rove, Lionel Sosa, a Republican media strategist from San, San Antonio, helped show him the way. Sosa had been inspired by Ronald Reagan in the late 1970s. As Sosa would later recall, Reagan had told him in 1978 that, quote, Hispanics are Republicans, they just don't know it. By that, Reagan meant that Hispanic families cherished Republican values, family, faith in God, hard work, and personal responsibility, and the belief that America is the greatest country in the world. Given their identity with bedrock Republican values, Sosa and Bush both believed Hispanics' desire to preserve elements of their native culture in their home pose no threat to Republican dreams or ambitions. To the contrary, Republicans such as Bush believed that they could harness Hispanic values to advance their conservative agenda, both on symbolic but potent matters, faith in God, love of country, and the importance of family values, as well as on social policies that Bush hoped to advance, most notably the substitution of a private, faith-based set of welfare institutions for the public one that had become so expensive and had allegedly caused so much moral deterioration among the nation's poor. 
Hispanics in Latin America were at the core of Bush's multiculturalist and transnational economic vision. Hispanics in Texas rewarded him by casting 49% of their votes for him in a su successful reelection bid in 1998. Blacks were not as important to the Republicans' grand strategy, either electorally or economically, and Bush did not expend the same kind of energy on them as he did on attempting to bring Hispanics into his coalition. Bush had had important and positive encounters with African Americans, including his work with poor black youths in Houston in 1973. When Bush ran for re-election as, as Texas governor a quarter century later, he asked a group of well-heeled African American Republicans in Houston to promote his candidacy in Texas's black communities, and they succeeded in turning out for him an impressive fraction, 27%, of the total African American vote. But neither in his gubernatorial nor his presidential campaigns did Bush ever make the kind of effort to appear in black churches or before black secular organizations that rivaled his Hispanic initiatives in comprehensiveness or intensity. Moreover, blacks occupied no strategic place in the grand Republican hemispheric economic vision that paralleled the important role accorded Latin Americans. This may help to explain why Bush and his political gurus were willing to jettison at a moment's notice efforts to bring blacks into the new Republican Party. Soon after winning his first race for the governorship in 1994, Bush told a Texas reporter that, quote, blacks didn't come out for me like Hispanics did, so they're not going to get much help from me. This willingness to turn against African Americans would be on display both in the elections of 2000 and 2004. I think I lost my microphone. Bush brought his multiculturalism to the White House. He appointed more minorities to positions requiring Senate confirmation than any Republican president in history. At the highest level, these appointees, including the first two African American secretaries of state, the first female African American national, national security advisor, and the first Hispanic attorney general in American history. 30 years earlier, these appointments of color would have been unimaginable in either a Democratic or Republican administration. Whatever one thinks of the particular accomplishments and failures of the individuals holding these positions, their presence in or alongside the cabinet broke the glass ceiling that previously limited how high minority presidential appointees could rise. Bush's close personal relationship with Condoleezza Rice may be the most remarkable relationship between a sitting president and an African-American woman in all of American history. The exact nature of, this, of that relationship, in particular the nature and the extent of their intimacy, remains something of a mystery. But the two evidently delighted being in each other's company and easily shifted back and forth between their professional and personal relationship. The many white Americans who have watched a black woman sit so close to the presidency and be involved with the president and his family at so many different levels has likely helped many of them to envision living in an America in which an African-American occupied the presidential seat itself, in such ways, perhaps, as Bush contributed to Barack Obama's path-breaking bid for the presidency of the United States. The Bush administration also made a significant, significant contribution toward maintaining a climate of cultural toleration in the wake of September 11th, when it would have been easy and popular to make America a Buchanan-like fortress. While the administration did subject Muslim and Arab communities and immigrants to intensive and intrusive surveillance, it also insisted on distinguishing between the radical Islamic fringe and the Islamic mainstream. In one of his first public speeches after September 11th, Bush called on Americans to respect the legitimacy of Islam and the law-abiding Muslims who practiced it. In so doing, he distinguished himself from two of his presidential forebears, Woodrow Wilson and Franklin Roosevelt, who in the era of their own wars made no parallel effort to demand toleration for law-abiding German Americans in World War I or for law-abiding Japanese Americans in World War II. Bush was keenly aware of the precedent of incarcerating an entire suspect population as the U.S. did to Japanese Americans in World War II. Norman Mineta, a Japanese American who had himself been rounded up along with his family during World War II, sat in Bush's cabinet as Secretary of Transportation and Bush knew his story well. At a cabinet meeting the day after September 11th, 
Bush declared, looking at Mineta, that his administration didn't want what happened to Norm in 1942 to happen again to Arab and Muslim Americans. Instead, the Bush administration worked to create attitudes toward the latter groups that were more tolerant than those deployed against Germans in World War I and against Japanese in World War II. It often was not successful in these efforts, as anti-Arab and anti-Muslim sentiment continued to erupt among many groups of Americans at the grassroots. I take note in this regard of the terrible mosque burning in Tennessee last year. But on the other hand, the Bush administration's efforts to encourage toleration has made it possible to broaden America's exposure to Arabic and to Muslim culture and history, developments that would have been unimaginable in regard to German culture in World War I and Japanese culture in World War II. The greatest benefits of this predisposition to cultural toleration no doubt accrued to immigrant populations that did not originate in Muslim and Arab lands. It would hardly have been surprising if the U.S. had shut off immigration in the first year or two after September 11th, much as the nation had done in 1921, soon after the nation had suffered through terrorist acts thought to have been committed by foreign-born anarchists. The United States damned some immigrant streams after September 11th, especially those originating in Arab and Muslim countries. Nevertheless, for almost six full years after September 11th, the United States retained its reputation as a society open to immigrants. During that time, millions of immigrants, especially from Latin America, the Caribbean, and parts of Africa and East Asia, continued to come to the United States. The Bush administration played a significant role in keeping the immigrant, immigrant gates open, and it took on powerful nativist groups and the Republican Party in order to do so. Hispanics, in particular, believed that they had a friend in the White House. They expressed their gratitude to Bush in 2004 by casting 40 to 45 percent of their votes for him, a doubling of the Republican percentage of Hispanic votes over what Robert Dole had achieved for the Republican Party in 1996. The importance of multiculturalism to the Bush domestic agenda can be gleaned, finally, from a signature piece of legislation passed passed just as Bush began his second year in office. No child left behind. This legislation required every public school in the country to ensure that a large majority of students in every one of the school's racial groups would meet or surpass government-mandated achievement levels in math, English, and other basic subjects. Schools that failed to achieve those levels would be given a number of years to remedy the situation. If they failed, they would fa face sanctions the loss of federal funds, the loss of students who would be given permission to enroll in better schools, the firing of school administrators and teachers, and ultimately the closing or state-ordered takeover of the failing schools themselves. No child left behind, in effect, shifted responsibility for achievement from the individual child and his or her family to the state. Local districts in the front lines, state governments overseeing them, and the central government as the ultimate enforcer of standards and of penalties. What could have prompted a conservative president to design legislation that so disregarded a sacred principle of American governance, namely local control of American public schools? And what could have prevailed on him to overlook a basic, basic conservative belief that individuals and their families, not the state, are responsible for their own well-being. I don't think there is a more basic conservative impulse than that. Bush's willingness to overlook such bedrock conservative principles suggests that a great deal was at stake in this legislation. Indeed, it was. Through no child left behind, Bush and his advisors thought that they could hammer the final nails into the coffin of affirmative action by offering minorities a new route to socioeconomic achievement. The seriousness of the Republicans' effort to address racial inequities through No Child Left Behind is apparent in their insistence that school achievement data be disaggregated by racial group and that each racial group in every school reach a mandated level of achievement in order for the school as a whole to receive a passing grade. If the Republican Party were to succeed in raising achievement standards across the board through No Child Left Behind and in closing the historic achievement gap between whites on the one hand 
and blacks and Hispanics on the other, they could then take credit for spurring minority success and advancement in ways that the liberals, with their soft bigotry of low expectations, never had. Minority voters, blacks and Hispanics, would then reward Bush's tough love Republican Party with their votes, thus ensuring that Bush would become the architect of that which he and Karl Rove most ardently desired, a permanent and multicultural Republican majority. Whether or not No Child Left Behind will succeed in reducing historic racial divergences in academic achievement is not yet clear. What is clear is that the implementation of No Child Left Behind and of Bush's multicultural program more generally has suffered from Bush's unwillingness to modify other aspects of conservative orthodoxy. Bush was deeply committed to slash, slashing taxes on the wealthy, even at the cost of depriving the government of needed revenue for No Child Left Behind. And Bush tolerated in his administration and in the executive branch more broadly a widespread contempt for public governance. Many Republicans had become so enamored of an extreme version of free market ideology, one that declared that the market could solve all problems and the government none, that they became surprisingly cavalier about even essential tasks of public administration. In Iraq and New Orleans, this contempt for public governance would yield catastrophic consequences. In Iraq, it compromised the reconstruction effort. In New Orleans, it allowed a great American city and its African-American majority to descend into disaster. The failure in Iraq and New Orleans became apparent at roughly the same time, fall 2005, and fatally damaged the Bush presidency. This was the moment when Bush's approval ratings plunged, never to recover. Bush's multicultural program was among the casualties. Among blacks, already angered by the Republican Party's effort to reduce their numbers at the polls in Florida in 2000 and in Ohio in 2004, the government's behavior in New Orleans evoked memories of a long-standing racist tradition in American life, that black life was cheap and not worth saving. Whatever gains the Republican Party had made among African Americans vanished, and it would be beyond Bush's power to repair what had gone wrong. Meanwhile, social conservatives in the Republican Party, who had never liked Bush's multiculturalism, seized on Bush's sudden weakness to revolt both against him and his multicultural dreams. They seized on immigration as the kind of law and order and party mobilizing tactic that Republicans had used to such advantage in the past. Conservative Republicans increasingly depicted both the country's toleration of porous borders and the presence of Spanish-speaking immigrants on U.S. soil as threats to core American values. They made known their belief that there would be no compromise with the 12 million illegals in the United States and certainly no road to citizen citizenship for them. This anti-immigrant campaign got off to a rocky start and as late as spring of 2007 seemed headed for defeat. But then it caught fire among the Republican rank and file, enabling social conservatives to scuttle the comprehensive immigration reform bill of summer 2007. The catching fire of the Republican rank and file compelled each of the Republican presidential hopefuls to take a hard line against immigration, and it compelled uh, a reluctant but weakened Bush administration into a nationwide campaign of raids meant to deport hundreds of thousands of immigrants directly and to scare millions more into leaving of their own accord. In the past year, as a result, Hispanics have been leaving the Republican Party in droves. Bush was not the only Republican absent from the party's convention in St. Paul. So too were the Hispanic Republicans. By every measure, the convention was the least diverse one that the Republicans had sponsored in more than 40 years. Very few blacks or Hispanics are likely to cast their votes for the Republican Party in November in a year when the turnout for both groups is likely to reach all-time highs. The administrative ineptitude that so damaged the Bush presidency in fall 2005 
and that triggered the revolt of Republican conservatives cost Bush a prize, the Republican Party's popularity among Hispanic voters that he had spent his entire political career attempting to win. What lay at the root of the collapse of Bush's multicultural program? One explanation would stress the impossibility of a serious multicultural politics ever emerging from the right. Even Bush, who supported No Child Left Behind, revealed how far he was willing to depart from conservatism to bring minorities into his party. He could not go all the way. To have renounced his tax cuts and taken seriously the challenge of governmental administration would have meant relinquishing his conservatism and becoming a liberal, something he was never going to do. Another explanation would treat Bush as a tragic figure. His virtues evident in this case in a serious commitment to creating a new America in which minorities and immigrants would feel at home, fatally compromised by character flaws that undermine Bush's ability to lead either in foreign or domestic affairs. A third explanation, and one that needs far more emphasis than it has been given, would stress that war changed everything for Bush. Just as the First World War ended Woodrow Wilson's efforts to establish a progressive America, and just as the Vietnam War undermined Lyndon Johnson's efforts to establish a great society, so too did the War on Terror terminate the Bush era of compassionate conservatism. So much of what Bush wanted to do, from a well-funded, no child left behind policy, to inventing a faith-based welfare state, from immigration reform to pursuing a hemispheric economic union, now became impossible to accomplish. It may also be the case that the burden of waging war also changed Bush, as it did Woodrow Wilson, inclining him to rigidity and robbing him of the flexibility and imagination and improvisational ability that had characterized his earlier career. What difference has the failure of the Bush multiculturalist initiative made in American politics? If Karl Rove were with us today, how would he answer this question? If he were willing to speak frankly, I think he'd share with us his worries about what the resurgence of anti-immigrant sentiments in the Republican Party means for that party's future. Rove is a keen student of American history. Among his presidential favorites is William McKinley, a Republican elected by large majorities in 1896 and 1900, assassinated in 1901. Why is McKinley Rove's favorite? Well, in part because McKinley had a brilliant, brilliant, brilliant campaign manager <laughs> named Mark Hanna, who in making his man president broke all the rules. But Rove also admires McKinley because he was a big tent Republican. McKinley crafted an appeal that crossed class, regional, and ethnic lines, an appeal that McKinley's success successors were able to maintain making the Republican Party the dominant force and close to a permanent majority in American politics from the 1890s to the 1920s. In the 1920s, nativist conservatives took over the Republican Party and ended the McKinley Big Tent era. They turned the party against immigration and against the new America, and with a little help from the collapse of America's financial structure, an event also known as the Great Depression, cost their party its hold on national power for 40 years. Could this be happening again? Well, I don't know any more than you who's going to win the election, let alone who's going to dominate politics in America for the next 40 years. But I will say that the Republican Party may come to regret its repudiation of Bush's and Rove's embrace of the new America more than it can currently imagine. Thank you very much. Um, 
we have some time for questions if anybody wants to ask them. Um, and someone may also ask, may we be released from this room so we can have a wonderful reception outside? But um, if there are questions, I'll be happy to try and answer them. Yes? The, um, and I thought about this, that the uh, old Bush family is um, an inheritor of the old Republican tradition, by which I mean uh, the Republican Party as the party of Lincoln and the party of emancipation, meaning a legacy of promoting the rights of African Americans. This was central to the Republican Party for <clears throat> the first 75 years of its history. And it's very possible, although I, I have not been able to establish this, that uh, some of, because of the rootedness of the Bush family in the Northeast and its, its root, some of its roots that go back to the 19th century, it's possible that some of that came through to the family uh, and to George W. Bush. But I have not been able to find that yet. It's, some, it's an interesting theory and, and one that I um, want to pursue. Uh, but I do think what's um, uh, decisive is in, in this case is uh, the move of the family to Texas and the exposure of the children, um, sometime by circumstance and sometime by plan, to uh, deep biculturalism in the state of Texas, um, which at least two of the boys uh, found very interesting and were deeply attracted to. Uh, and I think that that experience began to engender in Jeb and uh, George W. Bush a uh, willingness to think um, about um, diversity uh, in ways that older generations had not. And in this respect, I think it's important to see them as children of the 60s. You know, we tend to, one story of George W. Bush is that he hated all the hippies at Yale and did everything he could to make life difficult for them. And he, he was on the other side of the culture war. But I think given when they went to school and the revolutions occurring during that time, I think they were affected by that as well, making them more open to these kinds of multicultural ponderings and visions. There's a question. Oh, Hortense. Yeah, there's, well, um, Roseanne. Well, um, one of the, um, it's a very interesting question. Um, and uh, multiculturalism, as you suggested yourself, um, on the left and as well as on the right, can skirt class and economic issues. Uh, I think we can say that multiculturalism in America has done an extremely good job of um, helping to create uh, a diversity uh, in the middle class which, and, a, and, and opportunities in the middle class which in ways that it has not done for the poor. And I think it's true of the black poor. I think it's true of a lot of immigrant poor as well. Uh, and uh, I think Bush, one of the attractions to Bush because he's, um, uh, he's interested in uh, having his tax cuts at the same time as he's having his social programs. And when push comes to shove, he's not willing to commit the kind of resources that Johnson in the 1960s was willing to commit to promoting the interests of the poor. Uh, so um, I think he would say that he's trying to do this through um, education, and he's trying to do this through a faith-based welfare system but it's also true that the faith-based welfare system that he promoted was grossly underfunded and could never have become, with that kind of funding, a rival uh, to the publicly funded welfare state. Uh, so his um, promise of multiculturalism 
uh, was strongest, I think, among um, uh, middle class minorities uh, and to those who believed in his promise of opportunity for hard work, for educational achievement. Uh, but the multiculturalism of the right uh, founders on the same shoals of class division as, as does the multiculturalism of the left. Hortense? by the Republican Party of certain more progressive ideas, because I had thought that that belonged to pretty much the contemporary Republican Party only. So I was wondering what you would say uh, the difference is between that Republican Party that made a, a certain kind of decision concerning trade immigrants mm -hmm. in the early part of the 1920s mm -hmm. and the post-Reagan Republican Party that I would recall also was driven by the possibility of the vaccination and the party becoming uh, transformed in ways that are radical, mm -hmm. in ways that are unrecognizable. It is not the Republican Party sort of marching rocket or, 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 or a strong navy. Mm -hmm. So is there something um, that happened? Well, I know a lot happened, but how would you you mean the single most important factor that may have yes. triggered yes. Um, uh, the Republican Party becoming um, a narrower place? Um, I, in the biggest terms, um, it would be the Republicans' um, encounter and confrontation with um, the new America that was produced by the revolutions of the 60s. Uh, and uh, that new America is an America of racial equality. It's an America of uh, gender equality. It's, Amer it's an America of uh, sexual liberation. Uh, it's also in an America that is welcoming for the first time in 40 years immigrants into America once again. So um, if we want to boil it down to, um, to one factor, that's a pretty big factor. But if you, I, I think you're right to press for one in this case, uh, that's what I would point to. Uh, and of course, uh, racial politics are, are central to that. Not, not only that, because there's a lot of upset among Republicans in undermining what they regard as a normal family and sexual order. Uh, which are also bound up with the politics of the 60s. But, but race, in terms of transforming the Republican Party of the, of the post-1970s period, uh, I would say is, is the most important element of the new America, a society of true racial equality that the Republican Party is opposing. I think what we have to remember, and your question underscores it, is that there is a, another tradition in the Republican Party and that is the big tent republicanism of, we might say, Abraham Lincoln, the big tent republicanism of uh, McKinley, uh, and the big tent republicanism of Karl Rove and George W. Bush. Uh, and I don't want to underestimate the instrumentalist nature of their interests, especially Rove. You know, does, really, does Rove really care if there's diversity in America? Probably not. But he wants the Republican Party to be a permanent majority. It had been a permanent majority once before. And in his vision, it would be again. And so what I think what we've missed in this story and what I tried to offer um, a slice of in this lecture is the degree to which George W. Bush, surprisingly, becomes the vehicle of the rehabilitation of this big tent Republican Party that can aspire to a permanent Republican majority in American politics. And that because of the mistakes he made and perhaps flaws in his character. That dream, I think, now lies 
in shambles, uh, which I think means that the Republican Party risks um, exile into the wilderness again. I'm sorry? Okay, so I've been told the, I can't allow for any more questions now. So I invite you to ask them of me during the reception. Thank you very much.